Okay. Good morning. Florence is simply good and YouTube and the city of Florence. Hey, buddy. Praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Okay. And rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. All right, we've been going through the book of Acts. <laughs> and learning uh, more perfectly, it should be it should be called the book of uh, the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we've been traded, <laughs> and uh, we've been we've been seeing how the Holy Spirit has has expanded the church exponentially as the apostles and and believers obeyed. Obedience was the key. Miracles follow the obedience of the Lord. Amen. So as God helped the early church expand its witness for Christ, he used a variety of means and, uh, and events to grow the church all through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So before we get into this, I uh, just want to invite the, the Holy Spirit to anoint us this morning to receive the Word of God. Amen? Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much for the privilege of sharing your word together. We thank you, Lord, that you've preserved your word through all the ages. It's timeless, Lord, and it's appropriate for us today. And Lord, we ask that you would open our ears to hear and open our understanding to receive what you have for us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're going to start talking about interruptions. We get, we get on a track that we think is the track that God wants us to be on. And eventually, yes, Pastor. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. That's all right, and we're talking about interruptions. <laughs> Does anyone want a lesson leaflet? Yeah. One? Okay, one more So, as we go through life, we get interruptions, don't we? On a daily basis. And the key is how we respond to these interruptions. I think a lot of the times, and in a lot of the cases, these interruptions are God-breathed. Because we get on a track that seems right for, to us, but the Lord guides our steps. And a lot of times he has to interrupt our path to get us on his path. Amen? The key is to recognize when it's the Holy Spirit leading us another way. So uh, another reason why the, the Apostle Paul says, be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. So when we're led by the flesh, we're, we're leaning on our understanding, our, our understanding how we think things should go. I get in trouble all too often when I think like that. Because like in Isaiah, in chapter 55, verse 8 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, for my ways are higher than your ways. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. So what seems right to us is not always what God wants for us. So we need to be willing and able to recognize these interruptions that the Lord brings into our lives because he may be trying to get it, redirect us, re, reboot our brain, <laughs> so to speak, and get us on his page. Most of the time, people just don't like to be interrupted. Um, even when it could result in, in a positive outcome. We just don't like our agenda to be messed with. What happens a lot of the time? We bark, don't we? We get cranky. We chippy back 
Uh, I've, I'm guilty of that when my wife interrupts me sometimes. And in most cases, when she interrupts me, she's on the right track. <laughs> Us guys, just we, we're like both in a china closet. We just have a direction to go, and we're going to go with that direction. Not realizing that sometimes there are little side traps that we need to take. Amen? And uh, my wife is pretty good at that. And she knows when I need to change directions. And I really believe that a wise man listens to the counsels of his wife. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> How many believe that the gospel has the power to change lives? Amen. I believe that. It's the gospel that changed my life. I was on a, a path of, of pure darkness. I was involved in alcoholism, drug addiction, and witchcraft. Uh, not the path God wanted me on. So he, he gave me a major interruption in my life, which led to my coming to a little Assembly of God church, and I heard the gospel for the first time in my life, and it broke my heart. And I received Christ back in 1973, and, uh, and my life has not been the same. My life changed overnight. It was miraculous. Um, I had tried to quit drinking. I, had to tr I tried to quit using drugs. I, I couldn't do it on my own power. But God did it just like that. I didn't have cravings. I didn't have uh, withdrawal symptoms. It was so amazing. <clears throat> and uh, along with that, uh, I had a lot of friends that kind of sloughed off. They, they didn't want to be my friends anymore. So my life changed drastically. And it's not been the same ever since. So the gospel has the power to change our life and the lives of people around us. People were... You know, we, we last, last week we... We studied when Stephen was stoned. Stephen was working miracles. He was one of the seven that was appointed to minister to the needs of widows and uh, people that were being kind of neglected. And he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he knew the Word of God. And so as a result, he was working many signs and wonders. And uh, Stephen was stoned because the spiritual leadership, quote-unquote, of the day, were jealous because people were paying more attention to him than they were to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they stoned Stephen to death, not realizing that by doing that, they, they scattered the church. The persecution began to scatter the church. But they didn't keep quiet, did they? Everywhere they went, they, they spoke the gospel. They shared the gospel. And it was, it was just kind of like trying to put out an oil fire with water. Have you ever tried that? <clears throat> when I was in boot camp, we had fire training, fire uh, control training, and they they ignited an oil fire and gave us a, a water hose to put it out with. That was scary. As soon as the water hit the fire, it exploded in all different directions. That's what happened here when they stoned Stephen. They tried to put a fire out, an oil fire out with water hose. <laughs> they were covered in oil. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks for that analogy. What they didn't realize is they caused the church to expand. And, and in all, all over the world, when the church falls under persecution, I believe the church strengthens itself. It becomes stronger. 
Uh, more believers are added to the church. When the church is not persecuted and everything is going just so sweet and everything, we kind of get into a, a laziness. And I believe we've seen that in our country, in the United States. We've become lazy. We don't want to get outside of our little routine. Uh, I'm guilty of that. I just like to be comfortable. I like to survive within my little sphere of comfortableness. But the Holy Spirit is not, uh, that's not where He is with us. That's why I'm here today, teaching. <coughs> we thought we were going to just come down to Lawrence, Arizona and just retire and, and make daily jaunts to the swimming pool and just make a little journey here and there and explore and just be lazy. It's not, it's not in God's design for us. And I'm thankful that the pastor was pursuing me. He was listening to the Spirit of God. <coughs> And when I decided to teach, God began to, to teach me. When, I, when, you learn, when you do things in the body of Christ and you serve others, it opens the door for you to receive spiritual understanding that you didn't have before. God helps you to uh, mature in Him. That's how He perfects us, is through our serving Him and others. So, after Stephen was stoned, the church began to kind of spread out, and Philip was one of the seven. He, he decided, he was ministering the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit led him to go to Samaria. Now, does anybody re uh, remember the significance of Samaria as it relates to Israel? They were outcasts. Amen. It wasn't even permitted for a Jew to speak to a Samaritan, was it? That's why when Jesus met the woman at the, at the well, she was, she was surprised that he wouldn't even speak to her. Not only was she a Samaritan, but she was living in sin. And she knew it. Well, when Stephen went to Samaria... He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Samaritans were outcasts because they had intermarried. Uh, in the Mosaic law, you, the Jews could only marry within Judaism. They could, a Jew could only marry a Jew. Not only were they uh, interracial, but they were also uh, kind of, they deviated from proper Judaism in their beliefs. They were considered Mongols. Jews. Mongrels? Jews. Yeah. So they were looked down upon. They were not even classified as first class people. When Philip went to speak with them, he got their, their attention. They, they paid attention to his teachings. And many miracles were performed under his teaching. Uh, Demon possessed people were set free. People were saved, brought out of darkness. People were healed of sicknesses. One of the things that happens when the truth is proclaimed. We need to get a deacon like that. Uh, here <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when the truth is shared, people are drawn to it. Why? The gospel is a message of love. It's a message of a sacrificial love that the God, creator of the universe, almighty God, the only living God, it's his story of love to those he created. The Bible says that while he, he, he demonstrated his love, in that while we were his enemies, he died for us. He took upon himself our, the penalty for our sin. 
There's no greater love that could be demonstrated than that kind of love. So people were, the Samaritans were drawn to Philip and his, his message was being uh, heard all throughout Samaria. He was on a fast track to evangelism. And then there was an interruption. What was his interruption? Is anybody, is anybody familiar with this? section of the book of Acts? You got a ride. You got a ride. <laughs> the Lord caused him to leave his agenda where he was ministering to multitudes to focus on one single individual, an Ethiopian eunuch. He was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. He was from the country of Ethiopia. He was a uh, treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. And yet he believed in the God of Israel. And so he was in Jerusalem at the time, worshiping. And he had with him a scroll. Apparently it was a fair, fairly expensive scroll because it was a handwritten scroll. And it was the book of Isaiah, and he was reading out of it. And he couldn't, uh, he couldn't understand it. So the Holy Spirit told Philip to go and join yourself to that chariot. And so Philip ran to the chariot. It says he ran to the chariot. And he saw this eunuch reading out of the book of Isaiah, and, and Philip asked him, he just says, he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? That's a pretty simple opening, isn't it? Do you understand what you're reading? Let's see if we can go to that. Let's see if we can go to that. It's in the eighth chapter. Oh, I'm I'm looking at the time, thinking I was in uh, chapter 9, verse 49, and it's 9.49. <laughs> okay. My Bible shows the time right up here in the left, upper left-hand corner. <laughs> so in uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 26, let's see. I just wanted to read this because it shows... Uh, an example of somebody who is sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. So he came to the eunuch, he says he ran to him and heard him reading the Isaiah and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? This is uh, verse uh, 31. How can I unless somebody guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was like this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. <coughs> Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does, this prophet's, does the prophet say this is? Is it about himself? Or somebody else. <clears throat> so, what an open door. What an open door. He was actually at the scripture in the Old Testament. We didn't have a New Testament yet. Where it pointed to Jesus. And it described his crucifixion in the book of Isaiah. Philip said, this is Jesus whom we just crucified. And has risen again. And he, he shared with, with the Ethiopian eunuch the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he must have shared enough with him that the eunuch felt the need to be baptized. So he baptized him. And you remember what happened right after he baptized the eunuch? Poof. 
<laughs> the Holy Spirit took him away, and it said, it said, uh, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. Can you imagine what you would, what would you think? I, just, I was just with an angel. <laughs> The eunuch went away rejoicing because he had found Christ. And so here is another little spark that on its way back to Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, I'm sure the eunuch became an evangelist. He shared his, his experience. Hallelujah. The key point here is that Philip was engaged in a ministry preaching the gospel every day and the Holy Spirit interrupted him and said I want you to go to that chariot he was probably thinking about taking a little jaunt over to that chariot that was leaving town Philip was close to the Holy Spirit he listened to the Holy Spirit that tells me something about Philip, when we're doing things that we think are what God wants us to do, do we take the time to just listen to the Spirit? Oftentimes, we do things for the Lord. We do things for the ministry, but haven't been called to do them. And the result of that and this is kind of a little side, John. The result of that is burnout. A lot of people put their energy into things that God hasn't called them to do, and they get burnt out. And they get wore out trying to trying to minister to the gospel, and there's no results. They aren't appreciated. Have you seen anybody like that? Have you been like that? You're doing what you think God wants you to do, and you're just getting worn out, beat up. <clears throat> yeah, I look at the guy and that guy in the mirror a lot. Um, I've done a lot of things. I've, I've launched out in different men's ministries. It was a good idea, <clears throat> according to Bill Tucker. But I, I really, it just didn't produce any, any fruit. And I got disheartened. And the key was, I didn't hear the Spirit of God telling me to do this ministry. Now each one of us has been given a gift. We've been, we've gone over that. We've all been given gifts that are to be used in the body of Christ. Do we follow those gifts? Or do we even know what gifts we have? Do we even know what talent we have that God can use? I believe this is kind of uh, just letting us know to be ready for interruptions because we're going to receive, we're going to be interrupted by the Spirit of God when we're on what path we think is the right path. You know, we think we know what God wants us to do but he's got a little different jaunt for us to take. Why do you think it's important to be listening to the Holy Spirit? Why do you, do you think the Holy Spirit might speak something into your heart that's different when you, than what you think? Ways are above our ways. His ways are above our ways. I believe when the Spirit of God directs us to do something, He doesn't expect us to go unequipped. He leads us in directions that He's already equipped us to, to go into. Now we may not be confident in that, because initially uh, when you launch out in a new, a new gifting, it's, it's uneasy. It's intimidating. 
You're not sure that you're going to be good at it. And there's usually opposition, especially once it gets noticed. Amen. need to um, have quiet time with the Lord. And that can be when you're just driving down the road. You can be focused on the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak to us. He is speaking to us all the time, believe it or not. We just don't always hear Him. It helps to be teachable. Amen, Pastor. I think that we get more skillful at hearing the Holy Spirit when we begin to uh, be obedient to Him. We start listening and if we start identifying the Holy Spirit's voice over our own, our own voices of good intentions. And those are usually pretty loud. And the Spirit of God speaks in a small, still voice. <clears throat> So, God is wanting us to quiet our own heart down a little bit and listen to the Spirit because He wants to lead us in, in new paths. He wants to lead us in the pathway to interrupt somebody else's life with the Gospel, with an act of love, ministering to a need. Uh, we just need to be aware of needs around us. We're talking about, last week we were talking about how the church, when they began to minister as a body, shared all things in common. They actually sold possessions to meet needs of other people. Well, that's intimidating, isn't it? We all love our stuff. We love our stuff. I can't, you, I, you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive Him. You can't give yourself into poverty if it's in, in Christ Jesus. Now, I think you can, if you're giving, not, not listening to the Spirit, you can outgive, you can, out, you can give yourself into poverty. I've seen that happen. I've seen people write huge checks that God didn't call them to, to write as they were listening to a plea for money. And that the call to give wasn't necessarily wrong, but they didn't hear the voice of the Spirit. They just gave out of guilt or whatever the reason. Or they wanted to be noticed, so they gave. God wants us to give as, as a response to the Holy Spirit. He wants us to lend a hand as a response to the Spirit. We, we're called to help each other ministering to needs. So Peter was, uh, he was m moving around ministering and he went into a place called Lida, Lida. It's the only time it's ever uh, been mentioned in the Bible is in this one passage. And he came upon a, a person that yeah, was sick of it. He, he was paralyzed. Aeneas. And he, he was suffering from a long-term paralysis. He had, to be, he had been confined to his bed for eight years. It doesn't say whether or not it was an injury or, or sickness, but that he was just paralyzed. And Peter's actions reflected his experience when as walking with Jesus and his attention to the to the Spirit. He walked up to the guy 
And he just plain told him to get up and walk. And he took him by the hand, and, and the paralytic, or the, the uh, paralytic was, was healed. So what do we do when we are walking downtown, we see somebody sitting on a curb, they're obviously really down and out. Do we avoid them, or do we find out what their story is? I'm, I'm in a common position. I avoid them. But I don't think this is what God wants me to do. Now, I'm not comfortable walking up to a, a guy that's sitting on the corner with a little sign. Because they're all around us. The need is all around us. What do we do in a situation like that? Do we let the Holy Spirit interrupt our day? What do you think? We need to be led by the Lord. We need to be led by the Lord. <laughs> I'm just I'm just opening up some ideas here. How we who are believers, we've been saved. By grace, we've been pulled out of a world of darkness, and God has given us so much. And we're walking among people who have nothing. Many of them don't have any hope. And some of them are scammers. I think you said in a situation like that, I think you better show them some money before you start the, what is it? You better show them some money? Yeah, yeah. meet the need. Jesus well, met the need. Know. Jesus met the need, didn't he? And after he met the need, he began to minister to the individual. And he actually sometimes asked them to minister to him, like the woman on the well. He asked her to meet his need. And she began to question why he, a Jew, would talk to her, a Samaritan woman, and so that opened the door, didn't it? We just, we just need to be listening to the Holy Spirit, because He will give us an opening if we're listening. I believe that it's going to, it's going to take some experience before we really get good at it. We might fumble it up a couple of times before we actually figure it out. But if we sincerely are, are broken in our heart when we are faced with somebody's desperate need and realize that we can help, we may not be able to meet the entire need, but we can help, that act of kindness is going to get their attention and we may have an open door to share the gospel as a result. Well, so now we're going to go over to one of these shares of God's work. She was at the well, of, uh, Jacob's well, and she was drawing water out for her. I, I don't know if she had sheep or not, but she was, came, she was a, an outcast in the town. And so she waited till everybody else went to the well, and she was there by herself getting water. And Jesus walked up to her and asked her to draw him some water. Yeah. And that opened the door for him to share with her. Yeah, it was. Because she was, she was an outcast. Jews were not to have any part with the Samaritans. We get locked into rules about how to conduct ourselves. And oftentimes those rules interfere with the way God wants to move. So we, this is what the book of Acts is showing us, that God is interrupting our normal way of doing things. And he does it for one purpose, and that's to reach the lost. And a lot of people uh, say, well, that's the Old Testament. This is different. 
We're in a different age. What do you say to something like that? The Lord never changes. The Lord never changes. Somebody turn to Hebrews chapter 13. I believe it's verse... Hebrews 13, 6, I believe it is. I wrote it in the side of my thing, but I didn't. <clears throat> Somebody have that? Yes. I believe it's Hebrews chapter 13, verse, verse 6. Tim said it doesn't change. So if Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever, how does that kind of coincide with those are the Old Testament days, the New Testament church? We're into we're in the 21st century. Things are different. Is Jesus different? Is his heart different towards us? Are his techniques different? Pardon, Tim? He can like us, or he can't like us. It doesn't have to like us. That's right. He's, he's, he's all on his own, right? If we deliberately sin against him, he doesn't. He still loves us. He still loves us. But Jesus is the same. The gospel has, is the same. The gospel is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, perfect in every way, voluntarily went to the cross and he took on himself the sins of all the world. And he was judged for our sin. And when he rose again, he gave us the right to become children of God. Him. He doesn't change. His love for us doesn't change. It's us who have to change. Amen. We have to change from our old ways to our new ways. The new ways is when we believe in Him and believe that He died for our sin and that He is an all loving, never changing God, then we change because we want to be better than what we were. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So how are we to change? Really, we really aren't going to be able to change unless we have the Spirit of God. The flesh will not permit us to change, to become more like God. The Spirit of God is the only power that, that we have that helps us to change. We are changed by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us after we accept Christ. He lives in us. How do you respond to needs? You're supposed to give. You're supposed to give. You're supposed to help your fellow man. You're not supposed to look on them and say, well, I work hard for my money. They can get out and work too. Yeah. Well, there might be some reason that they can't work like a blind man or a man who, who's lame. They're depending upon others to help them, have some love in their heart, and help them. Amen. Even, I think mean, even people who don't have a legitimate need, but who have a temporary need, if somebody is willing to help them, that's going to get their attention. 
that somebody would dare help them. In this day and age, that's a rare thing for people to go out of their way to help somebody they don't know. That's rare. It gets attention. I had a little episode of that at the grocery store. I put something on the counter and I, I just left it there and people buy it for me and brought it to me. Oh, neat. Yeah. That's neat. That's, that's neat when people do that. It gets your attention. Yeah. You know, I just ask for one little thing. Yeah. And Amen. here you give me more, more abundantly. Amen. That gets their attention because they, they, their need for hope was what was immediate at that time. Yeah. But if you can see they need shoes, give them shoes too. Don't forget the socks. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, another good uh, example of somebody being interrupted, Peter was. Uh, ministering and, and uh, he was he was at a house in Joppa and he was hungry and the Lord and he fell asleep and had a dream a, a vision didn't he and I forgot to have Rob play this video do you have that video Rob <laughs> This would be a good place for it because this is basically has to do with this story. If you could just play that. Caesarea is known as Herod's city by the sea. Built by Herod between 20 and 10 BC, it is located on the northwestern coast of Israel on a major ancient Roman road. Cornelius, who was a centurion, usually in charge of up to 100 soldiers, of the Italian cohort was stationed at Caesarea, which functioned as the headquarters for the Roman authority in Israel. Unlike most Roman centurions, Cornelius was a God-fearer. God-fearers were actually a Jewish religious category in the first century. They believed in the God of Israel, denounced the Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses, and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. However, they did not go through the process of conversion, which involves circumcision for males, ritual immersion, and a temple sacrifice. An angel told Cornelius to send men to Joppa, modern-day Joppa, the next stop on the coastal plain south of Caesarea, almost 40 miles away. As Cornelius's men reached Joppa, Peter, received a vision of a sheet with various animals he was commanded to kill and eat. Peter was confused because he was a kosher Jew and had never violated the dietary laws, yet he saw the vision three times. Some have suggested that Peter's vision has to do with kosher law and that as a believer in Jesus, he would no longer have to follow these commandments but the vision was much more about Jews accepting Gentiles into the kingdom of God than it was about Jewish dietary laws. The goal here was not that Jews should start eating pork, cheeseburgers, or shrimp. The vision and Peter's visit to Cornelius dealt with the acceptance of Gentiles into the newly formed believing community. Those who interpret this as having to do with eating kosher miss Peter's own words. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Peter's men, described as believers who are among the circumcised, were amazed when Cornelius, his household, and his men received the Holy Spirit. This amazement indicates that Peter and the people with him continued to follow the commandments. The idea that salvation did not come from the law or its observance, but rather from God's mercy, was already a Jewish opinion. 
Peter was simply re-emphasizing what the Jewish believer already knew. Despite the fact Jews would continue to live according to the law, the Jerusalem Council decided that there was another way for the Gentiles to stay away from idolatry, fornication, and the spilling of blood. Thus, God had defined the way how each community would relate to him, both Jews and Gentiles. But salvation was a matter of grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Peter was a he, Peter was a Jew. He was a uh, kosher Jew, and uh, his his understanding of what was right and lawful was majorly interrupted right there. And God showed him that his gospel message is for every individual that draws breath. They don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to uh, go through sacrificial offerings and stuff like that like the Jews have had to do. God opened up salvation to the entire world. And so, you know, a lot of people will take that vision that he had and try to make it into, into something else. God's heart is that whomever calls on my name shall be saved. Whomever calls on my name should be saved. And it's our privilege to tell people about Jesus Christ. It's our privilege to share the gospel with those who may, who may not have heard it or those who may have heard a perversion of religion and help them set, help them to, to set this, the, the record straight. A lot of people feel like they have to do something to earn God's favor. That's not the gospel, is it? The gospel message is that we salvation is free because it's been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have access to eternal life in heaven when we pass this life. That is our message. And it's open to everyone. And I'm telling you, we're as guilty as the Jews are because we, we uh, judge people. Sometimes it's, it's subconsciously, we'll judge them. And we just, they don't deserve. They don't deserve this. <laughs> After all, look what they did. Am I, am I touching a chord here? When you see somebody who has just killed a bunch of people, what do, you, do you just want that person to burn in hell? It's what they deserve. It's what we deserve. It's what we deserve. God still loves them. It takes a supernatural act of grace. Amen. Amen. People not only kill, but they kill somebody you know. Yes. You know, Amen. That you love, like a child. Amen. Uh, I, I I can't imagine you know, what, what that situation would be like. Yeah, the, a good example of that is the, the story of Corey Tenbu, who was a survivor in Nazi occupied Germany. She was a prisoner of war along with her family. And she's the only survivor. And she, she found Christ. She, she made Christ her Savior. And later in life, she met the man who was responsible for the death of her family. He was in the audience where she was speaking. <clears throat> yes, and, and he accepted Christ. And he came up to her to ask her forgiveness. And they became fast friends after that because God gave her the power to forgive her. Well, we humans will judge other people. 
we judge whether or not uh, they deserve our attention. And I'm talking about the undesirable people that we see every day, the homeless people that are walking around. We make a judgment, don't we, as to whether or not we're going to sacrifice our time to bring the message to them. Just don't want to be bothered. I don't have the time to spend and talk to them because I've got to be over on the other side of town. We need to allow God to interrupt our daily routine. <clears throat> this Today's lesson was, was a lesson about interruptions and the results of those interruptions. I just want to encourage you, be in prayer, ask the Lord to make you sensitive to, to these interruptions. I, I think that if you could replay any given day, you could probably come across an opportunity that you had, but you didn't recognize it, to engage with somebody and at least help them minister to them, or even share the gospel with them. I know that's true in my life. We get so busy. We get so what we think is busy. <laughs> and we just don't want to be bothered. <clears throat> the church grows when people are willing to be interrupted and they're willing to give themselves to other people. Man's limited understanding often interferes with his faith. That's, that's my quote. <laughs> that's not any famous person's quote, but I, I believe that this is true. Our limited understanding affects or interferes with our faith sometimes. We need to be able to accept things that are beyond what we can understand. Because that's where God operates. He operates outside of our sphere of understanding. His ways are higher than ours. His goals are higher than ours. He's not willing that any soul perish. And we're the contact, we're the point of contact for lost souls, we are. <clears throat> if God didn't need us, or if he didn't engage us to be the point of contact, he'd just probably suck us up to heaven the day we get saved, right? If he didn't need us to do that. We have purpose in us in this life, and it's to be Christ's ambassadors, representatives of Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to share the gospel on each occasion, but you're going to minister, you're going to offer your help in the name of Jesus. Amen? Any, any input or questions? Or... Any thoughts? Has this provoked a thought or has this put you to sleep today? <laughs> All under conviction. The heartbeat of God is to reach the lost. I think we've all been guilty of having the interruptions but not acting upon them mm -hmm. in a positive way. Yeah, and you know what? Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that love the Lord. Amen? God doesn't condemn us for not sharing the gospel. But he encourages us to share the gospel. He wants us to share. He wants us. <coughs> There's so many scriptures that, that prod us to whom much is given, much is required. The Lord brought me out of a world of darkness. He gave me so much and then the other half of that is that I'm required to give of myself. 
I don't want to be selfish anymore. I don't want to be selfish. Basically what it boils down to. You know, I've got my own little family. Uh, I want to do what I want to do with them. And then a certain number of friends. And that's it. Lord bless me and my four and yeah. no more. Yeah, Lord bless me and my four and no more. Kind of, it's kind of a, a common attitude. And it's easy to slip into that attitude because there's so much stress throughout the week when we're trying to do our jobs and we, we're possessive of our quiet time, our personal time. We don't want to let go of any of that time. That's ours. When in reality, it's God's, isn't it? And I, I firmly believe that when we are exhausted and yet take the time to give to someone, God supernaturally recharges us far better than eight hours of sleep will do. Just try it. You might like it. Just share. Just share what you can with people. Oop, the watch is out. Got two minutes. Any input? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? We're talking about church growth. We're talking about expanding the Christian world in a world of darkness, which seems to be growing more and more dark and more and more hostile towards believers in Christ. What do we do in, in that, in the face of that? We love, don't we? We love people. Jesus said, they shall know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. That's the... That's the identifier, is that we have love for each other. We have love for those who are unlovable, or what we think is unlovable. Basically, every human being is lovable because they will respond to love, in most cases. Sometimes there's a few bad eggs. They just soon kill you as look at you. But for the most part, when we reach out our hand of love in Christ's name, in, in the anointing of the Lord, following the Spirit, that there's a supernatural power that comes along with that, to make that engagement a powerful contact. Uh, just try it. I believe that the more we try that, when we're in, in public, just talking to people, just finding out their story, uh, it's going to change our world. It's going to change your world anyway. Amen? What is your name? Candy. Candy. I don't know why I'm going to call you Kelly, but that's your <laughs> sister. Thank you for being here. It's a, always a pleasure. Would you like to close us in prayer? Sure. Thank you. Let's pray together. Yes, amen. Father God, we thank you so much for this reminder from your word, the importance of reaching out to others. And God, I, I know that uh, sometimes that can be difficult because we get we get bit sometimes and uh, uh, turned away. And it's, it's not always a positive uh, experience. But that's not why we are to do these things. We are to do these things because it's your will, because it helps us to learn, it helps us to grow in our, uh, in our understanding of you, and uh, it helps us to uh, be more aware of what your plan is for our lives, not our plans. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be aware of the interruptions in our lives. Yeah and to understand even more how important they are and the lessons that we can learn from them. Mm -hmm. I thank you, God, again for this time. I thank you for the brother who has shared with us today. And I pray, God, that seeds have been planted and that we will grow yeah. in our knowledge of you and our understanding and that in that way, your kingdom will grow too. So right. continue oh, yes. to bless us and be with us. Bless us in your name. Amen. Amen.
Lord. Well, we're glad you're here. Okay. Glad to have the uh, the, Fris the Frizzells twins. <laughs> and uh, hey, let's worship God. Come on. Uh, good morning. Good morning to our congregation here. Good morning to everybody that's online. Uh, I know that we have many needs, but we know a, a living God that can come down and touch each and every one of those. He can do it all. Uh, is there any prayer requests or testimonies that uh, anybody wants to, to share or, or needs? Pam? Uh, I need to pray for myself or my left leg. The knee and the ankle, they're both bothering me really bad right at the moment. My testimony is, again, we've made it to another week with Tommy on the straight now, and I said I was going to report on him every week that he's doing good, and it's there. He's uh, on his way now to try to get his driver's license back, which will help him a lot, but he's, he's done really good, so. That's an answer to prayer right there. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I ask special birthday blessings upon my grandson, James, not James, Glenn, who had a birthday yesterday and, my, and his mother's today, Andrea. So, special blessings for their birthday. Rob? Good for our dog. He found a third place to be back in the last few days. Dog. Your dog? Yeah. His name is Chicago. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're a close group here. <laughs> <laughs> they, they always seem to get into mischief or something that is always going on with animals like that, you know. Yep. And we know that, uh, uh, that our Lord also wants to touch animals because when he comes back, he is going to be riding yep. uh, the stallion. Anybody else? Uh, continue to pray for my great nephew, Rowan. He got third degree burns a couple of days ago. He's in the hospital. I believe he um, has already got a touch because he is deaf. And his name again was Rowan. Rowan, that's right. Oh, yeah. Sis? Traveling mercies for Adam going back to the slope and for Walker going home and for um, Sophie. She's just spiraling out of control. And also for uh, uh, Stephanie's dad, he he is uh, he flew back down from Alaska, and he's out there at the Mayo Clinic. And they're trying to figure out exactly what's going on or whatever. And so far, no news is good news. So that's how we're going to take it. But we do know that we have a living God that can move in on all of this and, and more. And we're going to give him the praise and glory on that before and all this here even gets started. Because we know that when he moves his hand, miraculous things can happen.
then just like the muscles in, in her arms and legs, how they're not as strong as they used to be, that's the same way with the esophagus. She's not swallowing correctly. And so um, it's just been difficult. She has to hold the weight. She has to learn to eat. She has to put a little bitty tiny bites, sips of water in between every two bites, soft foods, mechanically cut. It's just holding ball game for her. So just pray, pray for her. Really? And then also I have a report on baby Maddie. She's still progressing and doing really well. She's uh, opened her eyes now. You know, when you have a baby that's born premature, they're kind of like puppies. <laughs> they don't open their eyes a lot. But now she's opening her eyes and she's responding to her mom and her dad's voice. So they're just a happy family. So. And then I want to thank everyone for their prayers for mom last week. Anybody else? Frankly, my mom's been in the hospital about a week now, and doctors to find out the problem and help her, you know, be able to breathe. Tell so us a feeding tube, so hopefully they can figure out how to breathe. And then for me, give me the strength to go through all this. Isn't that the truth? I mean, sometimes, you know, it's hard. If it's hard on the, the family members than uh, with the person that's actually going through the stuff. And uh, we all need an uplifting on stuff like that. We really do. rejection medicine hasn't been working for about the last year and so he has to come down he is in the White Mountains so he, besides his handfuls that he takes every day uh, he has to come down every two weeks and get um, not shots but he sits through like dialysis sort of like you know then they take it out put it back in and stuff like that every two weeks and that is not going to do the And then also a friend of mine, her name is Denise. Denise. She has breast cancer. <coughs> we can look that up. Anybody else? Well, I'm sure that there's also some prayer requests uh, online or whatever. Uh, let us take all these here to the, to the Lord. Well, Heavenly Father, we need a lifting up. Uh, uh, you can move in on all these prayer requests, spoken and unspoken. We know that you are the mighty healer, that you can do miraculous things that sometimes we think it's impossible. Uh, but we give you the praise and the glory on all of that before these prayers are even spoken, because you know or we know that you can all already start working on all of these and more. We lift up in prayer on, uh, on the United States. Uh, as Bill had said, we're, we're in a dark area, this, this whole nation. Turn this whole thing around and just let's get some common sense back into this and let's get the Bible back in uh, to, to spread among the nation that we know that the Bible is the truth. Yeah. And we have to lift you up on that and uh, let, let our leaders understand and let their hearts open up to realize that, hey, uh, there's more to running a, a nation than just uh, being a figure. Let's, follow, let, let's pray that they follow and open their hearts up and know the right things to do. Also for Israel, we give you, we lift up Israel. They are a, a great ally to us. We follow them. 
we, we watch the signals from Israel and be with them as we are with them. We, uh, we know the answers are there. Help us understand them and just be with them. Protect them. Traveling mercies, please, for Tom, LaDonna, uh, uh, Celeste, Alan, Tyson, be with them. You know that uh, traveling mercies are, are important. Many times we merely think, like, oh, we're just going to get in the car and we're going to go. Well, sometimes things happen. Uh, be with them. <laughs> and be with all the people that are also around them. Uh, that common sense kicks in and people take their time and just enjoy your great nation that you have made here and enjoy this. But do protect them, uh, just be with them. Uh, uh, Tom's brother, Joel, also for Rowan, and, and just protect good justices. Uh, we can't quite understand sometimes when things happen, especially to a little one at five years old. Please be with them. Uh, be with the doctors, be with the anesthesiologists, be with the nurses. Uh, help them. Uh, just lift them up and let them know that, that you are with them. And just be with this little guy that uh, you, can, you can do miracles. And we're asking for a miracle on this. Touch him, please. Uh, for Sherry and Maria, shit. And sh is it Shangri La's mother? Yep. Uh, lift them up, please. Be with them. Also, for Pam and Ina, you know that whole situation. Uh, Pam's left leg. Uh, you know, as we get older, sometimes they're. We have we hobble a little bit more, and sometimes it's just years ago you you just really never noticed uh, the aches and pains. Well, now we notice the aches and pains a little bit more. They they become more pronounced. But sometimes we have to go through pains in order for the final result at the end of this road. And we're just giving you the praise and glory just to be able to touch this whole situation. Be with Pam, lift her up, keep her strong, as her mom is going also through. Uh, this uh, neck spur, be with her, keep her strong, do away with this neck spur, please, uh, and just uh, keep her mom in good spirits. Um, also, uh, there was a praise report that the son is doing good. We need to hear that because we know that we've been praying for that. Be with them. And just, and we're thankful that Pam can witness your workings on all of this because uh, you're with them and we appreciate that and we thank you for that. Uh, for Rob, for his dog, and again, as, as I said, we know that animals are important in the Bible because there's many uh, readings that uh, animals are there and we thank you for that, be with them, give Rob and, uh, the knowledge to know that you're with them. Uh, for Sis, uh, for Adam and Walker, for, for Traveling Mercies this week, we have a busy week ahead of us. Uh, been good visits, but good visits sometimes has to go to an end. Be with them as they travel. Uh, also be with uh, Sophie. Help her, please. Have that hedge of, of thorns around her to keep people at bay that are constantly knocking her down and setting her back. Uh, please lift her up and let open her eyes, open her heart, and let her know that, <laughs> that you can do miracles. Because we are witnessing right now, this is the decline of her, but we know that you can shine your light, your loving light on her, lift her up, turn her around, and also the ones that keep on approaching her, lift them up, turn them around, because they need it also. Uh, for Stephanie's dad, which is our, our daughter-in-law, uh, being that he's doing tests and everything at the Mayo Clinic, again, doctors, uh, the nurses, everybody, you were the first responders on many, many things like this. You have the knowledge, but we give you the praise and the glory for having that knowledge that the Lord has given you to share this 
uh, up against all these different medical issues, be with him. Turn this stuff around. Help him. Um, we need to lift up the Ukraine. You know that whole situation over there? Lord help him. Uh, we don't need history, history to keep on repeating itself. We need an uplifting over there. We, we need a cleansing over there. And as you do that, and other people are witnessing it, that they give you the praise and the glory for turning it around. Uh, for baby Maddie, for opening her up, for opening the eyes, we thank you for that. Every little, every little issue is a plus. We know that you're there. And we, we give you the thanks and the glory for that. Um, also for the mom that's in the hospital, to figure out all these different tests. Uh, sometimes these tests are, are mysteries, and sometimes the doctors and the anesthesiologists or the nurses don't quite come up with all these answers. But we know that you can move in on all of this, and uh, we've been in, in situations where the doctors have just kind of scratched their head and says, you know what? We know that there was something there, but we can't find it. So we're already going to give you the praise and the glory to be able to turn all of this around and be with us and be with them. Lift them up. Also for Jeff, for Jeff that has heart issues, uh, that the meds, uh, the meds need attention. Uh, give the, again, give the knowledge to these people that need the knowledge. Uh, you've already given them the, the knowledge to be able to uh, to administer this stuff, but sometimes they need a little bit of, an, of a, an, an eye opener also. Help with all of this and just do away with all this heart issue. Uh, you're the, you are the great physician of, of, of many issues and we give you the praise and the glory on that. Thank you. Uh, also for Denise that has breast cancer, Lord, uh, just help. Some of these people just need help, please. Uh, there's many, again, there's many facets that you can move in on. You've heard the prayers that were requested. Be with them. You, we know that you can turn this around. You are the great, the great healer, the great physician. As I look around our congregation, there's uh, many issues just right here that weren't even spoken. Touch each and every one of them, turn this all around, and we just give you the, the praise and the glory, and just bless each and every one of us. In Jesus' name let me pray, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to worship the Lord? We're going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and, and his courts with praise. John's going to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen. I'm glad to have this bass player up here. Amen. Good to see Alice and Kelly. And Sister Candy. She's a, she's a general and the uh, retired general from the Salvation Army. <laughs> uh, Sister Candy testified. <laughs> I just want to praise the Lord today. Uh, actually, I had a very interesting day yesterday. I had to drive, well, a, a memorial service in Laughlin. So I drove five hours there, two hours at, uh, at the service, and then five hours home yesterday. Wow. Um, but I kind of misjudged my gas a little bit when I got, to, when I was in Laughlin, I said, oh, it says 50 miles, I can go. and. Um, but then it's a really steep hill getting out of the, <laughs> the gorge of the, the Colorado River, and I just kept watching my gas about mm -hmm. going down, 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 and there was nothing, nothing for miles. And boy, I did some heavy duty praying. But I have been trying to do some heavy duty praying all the yeah. time because we look at our world today and we're we're on empty yeah. in our world. And I just am so glad that I know God's in control. And he got me through yesterday, and he's going to get us through, and we just keep trusting in him and following him in our lives. Yeah. Amen. I'm so glad you're here. Me too. Our God is an awesome God. Let's worship him this morning. You can stand, sit, uh, 
You can lay on the pew as long as you don't go to sleep and start snoring. But uh, let's give him praise this morning. When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. Thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. Turn us very close so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. Heaven above with wind and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. Heaven above with wind and power and love. Our God is an awesome God. When the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath He poured out of Sodom. Mercy and grace He gave us at the cross. I hope we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns heaven above with wind. Our love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Hallelujah. Give him praise in this place. Amen. Amen. If you, if you came prepared to give, you can Bring your tithes or your offering. Amen. If you uh, got a thousand dollars, we'll take it. Uh, praise the Lord. We're still trying to raise the rest of the budget on the, the car for uh, Lorraine and her family. And so keep that in mind. How many like the way the, the place looks outside? Doesn't it look good? Amen. Well, that cost is going up, so. Uh, <laughs> Summertime and electric bill. Oh, I, I guess I better shut up. Amen. Anyway, we appreciate your support. And uh, so, who's got faith to believe for a large offering? Amen. Candy, go ahead and pray for it. You've had to you've had to raise some money before, haven't you? <laughs> All right. Would you want me to pray? Good, would you? Yeah, yeah. God, we just say that you're an awesome God, and so we know that you know the needs of this place. Yeah. We know that uh, uh, the hearts of the people, and God, we just put our trust in you for whatever you um, have. But we believe in a big God, yeah. and uh, we just pray, Lord, for that right now for us. For abundance to come on this day. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. How many are glad that he set you free from your sin? Amen. Turn your life around. Once like a bird in prison I went. No freedom from my sorrow I fell. But Jesus came and listened to me and glory to God. He set me free. He set me free. Yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound my Jesus to see for glory to God. He set me free. So now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground and glory to God. Well, I'm homeward bound. He set me free. Yes, he set me free. He broke the bond of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. Glory to God, He set me free. 
So it's goodbye to sin and the things that can bow. Not of this world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to glory to God. I'm going through. He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound by Jesus to see. Glory to God, He set me free. Yes, He did. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so get it out of your system. Everybody say, So. So, okay, let the redeemed of the Lord say, so. so, all right. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, praise the Lord. And I sing glory. Glory, glory to His name forevermore. Glory, glory to His name. All right, so this time when we sing it, we get to so say it real loud. Just scream it out, okay? Ready? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Praise the Lord. And I sing glory. I sing glory. For glory to Him. How many have been saved over 15 years? Praise God. How many have been saved over 30 years? All right, few. Praise God. That's a lot of experience in it, represented in a small crowd, isn't it? All right. Well, we're going to, uh, after the message, we're going to partake of communion together, and so we're honoring the Lord. We're lifting him up. We're doing what we do in remembrance of him, aren't we? Because he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. And think about what you're singing and uh, just let, let him renew your experience in him again. Amen. Pam, when you get a chance, would you check and see that? Thank you. You know what I mean. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sin. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wound, by his wound, we are healed. Thank God. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sin. His punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wound, by his wound, we are healed. How many have been healed by the Lord? Oh, we are healed by your sacrifice.
Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You know, I, I think some people, some people are uh, not where they think they are because they have believed. You know, you can believe and still not accept Christ. Do you know that you know that you know that your name is written in heaven because you've accepted him, right? How many know that's important? See, demons, demons believe, right? But they're not saved. And so I think we also have to believe that God raised him from the dead. Above all power, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began, above all kingdoms. Y'all gonna help me preach this morning? Yes. What? Oh, okay. Okay, great. Appreciate that. We're gonna be starting in First Corinthians, chapter one. First Corinthians. How many have discovered that there is power in the cross? Oh, there you go. The message of the cross. It's foolish to the world, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, it's just it, it's just so foolish. I mean, if you if you imagine yourself back in that time, and they saw people executed this way. You know, it would be about the equivalent uh, instead of what we have displayed over here on this on this side of the church. You know, if we had a uh, had a, an electric chair uh, symbolized, or or had a, a a hangman's noose hanging down, right? That's uh, that doesn't make sense. But oh, when the Holy Spirit opens it up and we see the glory of that cross, then you just uh, uh, and, and when you've accepted it, 
Praise God. What a, what a difference it makes. Right? All right. 1 Corinthians. We're going to read verses 17 through 24. For Christ didn't send me, Paul said, to baptize. And you know, I, I, I think that's a, a good indication that uh, it's not absolutely necessary for someone to be baptized in water to be saved. Uh, I'm for baptism. You know, we practice water baptism. We believe in it. Sometimes there is a, a delay, though, right? Thief on the cross never was baptized in water. But Jesus met him in paradise, right? And so I just I thought I'd mention that. Now, I think it's a whole different thing, though, if somebody refuses out of pride or some reason. They don't want anybody to see them with their hair wet. Now, that's a different thing. But anyway, that, that didn't cost you anything extra. I was just throwing that in there. But he called me to preach the good news, not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. The wisdom of God, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. Right? Broad is the way, right? Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads. And uh, there's a lot of people that are professing, not only professing Christ, they're professing to have great ministries. Jesus said, they're going to stand before me and say, oh, we did all these wonderful things in your name. And he said, I never knew you. I never knew you. And so we need, to, we need to know if there's any doubt that you have in your heart, in your mind, uh, get that settled. I mean, if you, don't, if you don't receive anything else this morning, receive that, okay? How many know Jesus is coming? We need, to, we, we need to get our ducks in a row, brother, and we need to start preparing our hearts for his coming. All right? But we who are being saved know that it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. That just gives me encouragement. <laughs> it's foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. There you go. I probably should have told you I was reading the message, but uh, uh, that's, that's good, isn't it? Yes, it is. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you, Lord, for a Savior that went all the way for us. We thank you for a Father who loved us so much that you gave the, uh, the ultimate, you gave... The, the highest and holiest, so that we could be redeemed. We praise you for that. Help us, Lord, to be stirred in our, our souls and in our spirits once again. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So all this is a reference to the religious world. Okay, that's, that's the world we're not to love. The, the world, uh, you know, the material world. Uh, God so loved the world. He loves the people of the world. Okay, when you came to church this morning, how many know that this building, these four walls are not the church? You're the church. You're the church. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, and uh, they're fading away. I don't know about you, but I'm, feel, I'm, I'm feeling more decrepit all of the time. I'm, I'm longing and looking for that new body. But all religions are not the same. They're not different ways to the same God. Right? Jesus said, I am the way. He's the only way. Uh, even if you've got a Christian fish and Buddha in the center, uh, it doesn't mean a thing. One thing that sets apart all others is the cross. The preaching of the cross. And the world does not receive that message. 
Uh, the world is always looking for a do what you want to religion. That's what they want. They want, a, they want an easy way. Second Timothy 4, 3 and 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I believe we're there. We're there. Uh, there, there was a drift, there was falling away before the pandemic. And now that uh, we've had uh, the pandemic and, and uh, you know, God forbid a, a monkey pox or something doing that same thing all over again. But uh, folks, we, we have, we've got to uh, be bold in our faith, right? There you go. We got to be faithful to what he's commanded us to do. After their own lust, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Okay, well, uh, what about, what about if, it's, if, it, if it's got Bible included in it? That, that cleans it up, doesn't it? Like the Book of Mormon. Joseph copied out whole passages of the King James Version of the Bible and put them in there. Does that, does that make it acceptable? No. You know, if I, if, if I offered you a beautiful plate of brownies, you know, and they just look so delicious, you know, and you see nuts sticking out of it, I've been craving brownies. <laughs> but I told, you know, I told you, now, you know, you're welcome, you're welcome, my brownies, but I gotta tell you, there's a secret ingredient in, in there. And, uh, you know, you, might, you need to know that. I just included a half a teaspoon of dog poop. Oh, yum, yum. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how many would want the brownie? No. Okay. Enough said. Way more than enough said. I hope my wife's not listening. All right. <laughs> uh, in spite of the worldly views of the cross, the church must never lay down its bloodstained banner. You all said you're going to help me preach. Now say amen once in a while. When the followers of Christ began preaching the cross, they were met with opposition. The Ephesian encounter, right? Stephen and Paul were stoned. Stephen didn't survive it. Um, God raised Paul up and there were many put to death. But the power of the cross was seen in the saving of souls all over the way. It's still working today, isn't it? There you go. And time and technology do not change the fact that we're born in sin and we need a savior just as much as they did. Right. And we haven't changed that much, have we? Right. As a, as a uh, creation. And Jesus Christ bore our sins on an old rugged cross. And it's only through the cross that we can be saved. And so the cross, uh, take the cross out of Christianity, it's, it's a dead religion like all of the rest of them. And there are enemies. Um, you know, there's a very good possibility that before the Lord comes, now I'm not, I'm not saying this has to happen, but uh, there's a lot of, lot of indications that the church could go through some real persecution before he comes. Are you ready for that? Have you made up your mind that uh, whatever you're confronted with, someone may be putting a, a gun in your face, are you ready to say, uh, to not deny the Lord? Ready for that? What about if it's uh, your, your, one of your family members? Could you stand up to that? That would be difficult, wouldn't it? We need to make up our mind now in case it does come, right? That we're gonna stand. We cannot, we cannot compromise in this. We've gotta stay true to the Lord. He said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. And so many walk, of whom I told you before often, now tell you, weeping, that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. And so there's, there's as much opposition today uh, with this uh, Marxist, uh, communistic message that's permeating everything. You know, I thought, uh, like a lot of you did in the 80s, when, uh, you know, Reagan said, take this wall down, and it seemed like that uh, uh, communist, communism in Russia just blew up, and, and uh, 
and was dissolved. I thought, well, that's the end of that. I mean, there's a resurgence of it today. Yes, it is. They're being taught it in our schools. Yeah. And it's, it's an antichrist message. Uh, one of the attorney generals of the United States a few years ago interviewed on CBS 60 Minutes said a cultist is one who has a strong belief in the Bible and the second coming of Christ, who frequently attends Bible studies, who has a high level of financial giving to a Christian cause, who homeschools their children, who has accumulated survival foods and has a strong belief in the Second Amendment, and who distrusts big government. And of these may qualify a person as a cultist, but certainly more than, than one of these would cause to look at this person is, as a threat, as his family, uh, being a risk situation that qualifies government interference. That qualifies the government to interfere with somebody like that. And so that was several years ago, and that was on, that was on national television. And so Jesus never said Christianity would be popular. As a matter of fact, he said the very opposite. He said, they hated me, they're gonna hate you. And so we need, to, we need to realize that going in. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? And uh, we're, one, of, one of the rights we are supposed to be guaranteed is a freedom of speech. And a lot of times that, that right uh, means nothing right. to a lot of people, right. okay? And uh, so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but my, by me. Verily, verily, I say to you, John 10 and 1, he that enters not in by the door of the sheepfold. Who's the door? That's Christ, isn't it? But climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And so many compromise the preaching of the cross because uh, they get a, a backlash from it. But Galatians 6 and 12 is as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Uh, it's the most simple structure that anybody came up with, you know, just a, a cross, two, two beams crossed together. Uh, and I, you know, uh, I don't think we necessarily have to uh, wear it on our, on our persons, but I, I want to suggest to you that if you do wear an emblem of the cross and a necklace or a bracelet or something like that, uh, I strongly suggest that it's an empty cross, okay? Because we don't want any, by any shape or form to crucify again the Son of God, do we? A cross should be an empty cross because uh, he didn't stay there. And uh, he arose from the dead. Praise God. A uh, little thing about uh, science that I found was interesting. Lillian B. Neoman's, uh, Yeoman's experience firsthand what it meant to desperately seek healing in an effort to keep it with the, the workload at our medical practice. This physician became addicted to prescription medication and she didn't find freedom until she learned what the Bible had to say about healing. And so this is, this is from uh, The Balm of Gilead by Lil and B. Yeomans, MD, uh, from the Gospel Publishing House. And it's, I think it's a free book. You can get it, uh, from, uh, get it on Kindle or iBook or Nook or some, any of those things. But uh, the blood, our blood, and the blood of the Lord Jesus, we read that his death on the cross destroyed that that had the power of death, that is the devil, Hebrews 2.14. So if the saints and God can now overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 12.11. Our blood has many benefits, okay? And uh, here's three of them. Human blood defends the body and actually conquering uh, deadly microbes when they get into circulation. The soldiers of the blood, the white corpuscles called leukocytes, stand up and fight them to the death. So the blood of the lamb overcomes Satan power by uh, the power of sin and sickness and death. If we believe 
and use it and appropriate it, right? We're priests unto God, and uh, it's our prerogative to use the blood. Believe that uh, Jesus has that kind of power. But what, what did Revelation 12, 11 say? They, they overcame the devil, right? right? By the blood of the lamb and the, and the word of their testimony. And so uh, blood has a, the power of coagulation. It stops the bleeding, it seals up the wound and starts repair work on the point of injury. And the blood of Jesus heals our wounds, makes us whole and strong and sound. And the blood continually bathes every cell in the body and tissue lymph. And it's, this is a proper atmosphere without which uh, we couldn't live. And the blood of Jesus brings us into communion and fellowship with God the Father by his son, right? God said, I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat, the place where the blood was sprinkled. Leviticus 16. Leviticus 17 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's where our, our real life is. And so these things, are, that, that's fascinating to me. I, uh, you know, I, good truth. Ephesians chapter 2, would you turn to it? Uh, I want to read verses 12 through 22, and we're going to leave plenty of time to uh, not rush through the communion part of this service. In those days, that's before you were saved, before they were saved, uh, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God, without hope. But now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to find to God by means of his death and our hostility toward each other. That's one of the signs of the last day that uh, race would rise up against race. That's the that root meaning of the word in the Greek is ethnos, and that's different races. Are we not seeing that? Right. And, uh, and so, uh, but in Christ, we're one, aren't we? Now all of us can come to the Father through the cross. Uh, the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together we are His house. There it is. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ. Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, become a holy temple for the Lord. And through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. The cross was a battering ram that broke down the barrier, broke down the wall of separation, the gap, right? And uh, he has given us the cross as an instrument that brings peace. And it's the power that destroys the work of sin. Colossians 2, 14 and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, that's why sin stinks, it's spoiled. Anything spoiled stinks. And uh, he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. That was weak. <laughs> it's the cross that makes us a part of the church, the body of Christ. It's the tool that we need to understand or to reach a lost world. You know, and uh, many times we say, well, if I can get so-and-so to church, maybe they'll get saved. You know, and... Uh, well, uh, you get them to church, you know, hopefully they'll listen and, 
and respond to the message it preached. But you know, we we all are, are carried. We're all evangels. We're all supposed to be witnesses unto him. And when you know about the cross, the cross is, is a, a bridge, isn't it? It's a bridge for people to get to God. You know, we, we could not have a, a, a genuine relationship with the Father until Christ came. But now he, he said, he's my Father, but he's your Father too, right? That's glorious, isn't it? There you go. Amen. He told us to pray to him, our Father, our Father who's in heaven. And uh, praise God. What a privilege. What a privilege it is. And uh, I think about that, uh, that, that Old Testament tabernacle. And, and uh, you know, boy, that was, a, that was a complicated religion that they had to fulfill. And all these sacrifices and everything, everything had to be just, just thus and so. And, and uh, only, the, only the high priest, and that once a year on the Day of Atonement, could go in, you know, and take it. And, you know, uh, they, tradition says, the Bible doesn't say, but uh, if everything wasn't just right, you know, they had to tie a rope to his leg in case, you know, uh, something about what he was doing wasn't exactly according to the specifics of the law. And uh, he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And that one, one man, one high priest, enjoyed the blessing, enjoyed the, the, the glowing Shekinah glory. And I'm sure that uh, he radiated that when he came out. You know, they probably wanted to get close to him so they could feel that. But praise God, we're so privileged, you know. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and he said he will be with you and he shall be in you. There you go. What a glorious privilege that is. That's right. Amen. And uh, David said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <coughs> Praise God. The main idea of the 23rd Psalm is God shepherds his people just as a, as a sheep herder does. And Psalm 103 says, know ye that the Lord, he is God. And he's made him. He hath made us, and we not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amen. And, uh, you know, I think uh, probably the rod was used sometime if the sheep, uh, you know, was, was trying to uh, get too far astray or something. He might have given him a tap with the rod, but his staff, that long staff, uh, that, that was a comfort. David said, because uh, he could, if there was a poisonous snake, he could uh, kill it with the kill it with the staff. Or if uh, the sheep, you know, uh, started getting rowdy or, or getting out of the bounds that the shepherd wanted, he could pull them back with that. And so, uh, and so that's uh, that, that's a comfort to us, Amen. And it's a comfort to me to know that. Uh, he will come if I'm at all listening, you know, if I'm not so full of myself and not, uh, uh, you know, just head headlong in, in some pursuit that's not of God, you know, he'll correct us, won't he? There you go. And we need, we need correction. Nobody likes correction. I don't like it, you don't like it, but sometimes we need correction. That's right, every one of us. Right. And so the great shepherd, four times in the word of God, John 10, 11, Hebrews 3, 20, 1 Peter 2, 25, 1 Peter 5, 4. And so Jesus didn't walk around with a shepherd's staff because his earthly occupation wasn't herding sheep. But he did say, I will build my church, didn't he? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The preaching of the cross is comforting, reassuring, and... Uh, and so it's only through the cross the loss can be saved. A lamb would get itself in a dangerous place sometime, but the crook of that staff, he could bring him back. And so he uses the cross to uh, uh, reach out. He uses, I mean, he uses the staff. And uh, so we know we have an enemy, but through the cross we have protection. Praise God. Our enemy is, uh, there's no mercy in him. I think uh, 
You know, I think that uh, the Lord has a, a leash on him, or he would just completely destroy us <laughs> if he could, right? He, he has no, uh, no feeling of compassion whatsoever. And so sheep were a vulnerable target for hungry wild animals, and the shepherd's staff afforded protection. And Satan's like a wild animal, always looking for a meal. So 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, he's not a roaring lion, but he's as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Praise God. And there's a comfort from this, isn't it? In the cross, we find guidance and direction. And uh, sheep have a tendency to, to wander off. Now, this is not a very complimentary uh, picture, is it? Uh, how many have been around real sheep? Uh, they're dirty, right? They stink. Uh, they're stupid. And, uh, and yet the Bible says, oh, we like sheep. We're like sheep. We've all gone astray. There you go. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for his mercy on us. They have no way to protect themselves. Sheep don't have fangs. They don't have claws, you know. Um, and so they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty helpless, as we are. We are helpless yes, we are. without the Lord. And we can't, we can't afford to be independent of him, can we? And so... Uh, he knows, you know, if we're not uh, paying careful attention, we'll, we'll wander off and get ourselves in trouble. And uh, Many times we face circumstances where uh, we're not sure what direction to go. And he's there, if, you're, if, you're, if you know how to listen. He said, my sheep know my voice. They won't turn to the voice of another. And so Hebrews 12, 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now before the compass was invented, sailors used the stars, didn't they? Right. Constellations to guide them, and primarily the North Star. As long as they could see the stars, they could find their way. And we go through uh, places in life, uh, maybe full of danger, Amen. How many have had a close call? Oh, yeah. I had one this week, this last week. Uh, you know, and I go back in my mind and think how bad that could have been if the Lord had not been with me to protect me. I, I love uh, the verse in Amazing Grace that says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come, but His grace brought me safe thus far. His grace will lead me home. Praise God. There is a glory of the cross. The message of the cross is foolishness, but uh, to those that are headed for destruction. Amen. The cross equals shame turned to glory. Of all the forms of death that are conceivable, crucifixion was the worst, probably the most feared, and uh, was for the worst of criminals. Never think about, uh, uh, you know, they, they called for Barabbas. Pilate was trying to find a way. He could, three times he said, I find no fault in him. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not a criminal. You know, I'm going to just I'll tell you what, I'm, we'll, we'll whip him and let him go. No, no, he got to be crucified. Well, you know, it's, it's Passover season. It's your, it's your tradition that someone... Uh, be released. Well, give us Barabbas. Barabbas is the worst kind of criminal. Think about his name. Bara means son of. It's, it actually breaks down to son of Abba. He was, his name is son of God. And uh, praise God. Now I'm a son of God and I got to go free. Just like Barabbas. And I have, uh, I have blown it. What about you? Have you really blown it a few times? I have. Fallen on my face. But uh, thank God 
for the mercy and grace, right? And the cross demonstrates God's omnipotence. If you want to save a world, a cross would probably be the last thing that you'd want to use. There's a song, I, I don't know it, but uh, uh, one resource says, what a strange way to save the world. We need to check that out sometime. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 28, instead God chose the things of the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. He chose the things that are powerless to shame those that are uh, powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. So if you ever get puffed up in pride and you know you think you're really about something, go back and read that, right? It'll humble you right down. God transformed the cross from an instrument of death to one that would bring eternal life. Who, who, could, who could have figured that? Who could have uh, predicted that? You ever wonder why rock stars and heavy metal singers, uh, a lot of times, when they're up on stage, they've got a cross hanging around their neck. Anybody notice that? Yes. And so Satan is an imitator. He'll take the things of God and try to change the meaning and bring the honor to himself. And uh, the things that originated in the presence of God, he always has a counterfeit for that. He changes things and uh, tries to change their meaning and... Uh, I don't want to get off the track here, but uh, God demonstrates that God has no weaknesses through the cross. Okay? The cross demonstrates God's wisdom. Paul said that we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world under the glo our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And of course, that speaks of earthly rulers. And uh, isn't it amazing that when they were, they were uh, had him down and driving those spikes into his, uh, I believe it was his wrist bone. Yeah. Hand, hand wouldn't hold the weight. It would tear out. They had to put it right through the, right through the wrist at the bottom of his hand, right through those nerves. And doing the same thing probably to his ankle bones, not the feet. Feet would, would tear out. But, uh, oh, what a death he died. And while they were doing that to him, he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a Savior. Bless his name. And so uh, we've got one, uh, one volunteer here to help us. And... Uh, Tito, would you come? And who else will come and help him make the elements uh, available to us? Okay. Which? I should have warned you about that. said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is what the Lord himself said, and I pass it on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Praise God. You know, in this passage, he also says that we are to examine ourselves. This is a good time uh, to just search your heart, you know. Uh, uh, we don't expect you, you know, if you think, of, do you think of something that you did or you didn't do that was a transgression, don't go running out of here. 
That doesn't happen too often, thankfully. But, uh, and, and don't refuse it because you think you're unworthy. None of us are worthy. We're not worthy of the body and blood of the Lord, but it's grace, it's grace that we're accepted. Praise his name. Hallelujah. I like the, uh, we gotta get some more of that uh, Jewish matzo bread because it's not only without any yeast. How many knew that yeast is a type of sin? There's no yeast in it. It's striped and it's pierced. And the Jews use that for generation, you know. Uh, how many have been in attendance at a Seder meal? Well, that's, a, that's amazing. All the different types. Thank you, brother. Did you get one for yourself? Okay. Thank you. He took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it. He says, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Praise God. Hallelujah. John, would you ask God's blessing on the bread that represents his broken body? Would you pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just ask you so much to help us. And we ask you, Lord, in your name, to bless this to our bodies as you intended it to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's protect you. Amen. We sang the song, By His Wounds, We Are Healed. Amen. The Bible says the stripes were put on His back for our healing. Praise the Lord. As you're uh, chewing that up and swallowing it, think, you know, if you need a touch in your body, uh, claim that today. All right? In the same way, He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Praise the Lord. Sister Pam, would you ask God's blessing on the cup that represents his shed blood? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord, for his, the stripes that he bore, the blood that he shed for us, Lord. And we just ask that you, every time we think about taking the communion, Lord, that Praise we God. remember it was by his blood that our sins were washed away. We do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. one of the gospels it says uh, uh, they sang a hymn before they went out so what should we sing at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise God. God. We're gonna, yes, thank you, Jesus. So the Lord willing, we're going to have a service here tonight in the sanctuary. And we hope that you'll come and be with us. Praise the Lord. Anybody else got anything you need to make us aware of?